Hello, my name is Matthias and welcome to the FPL Scope and this video where I'm going to talk about the best replacements for Diogo Jota and Darwin Nunez. Both those players have been pretty popular the last few game weeks, especially Game Week 24 against Burnley at home and then Double Game Week 25 where they were supposed to play against Brentford away and Luton at home. But midway through the Brentford game, or at least right before the half for Jota and at the half for Darwin, they both had to be subbed off with injuries that are most likely going to keep them out of Wednesday's game against Luton at home. So in the end, just 11 points from Game 24 and Game 25 from those three really nice fixtures, it seems like, from Darwin and Jota. Quite a letdown, but we just have to move on. There's no reason to keep them. Uh, they're not going to have uh, good fixtures going forward. They're both blanking Game 26, which is something we knew already. Most people were actually ready to replace them, regardless of them being injured or not. So um, that's especially on the cards now, because... You can't really trust, especially Jota, but also potentially not Darwin Nunez to be back for Nottingham Forest away in Game Week 27 either. So, so yeah, we need to replace them. And there's also kind of a, um, a conundrum there with how you're going to replace them, especially Jota. Darwin, I think, is pretty easy to, to figure out how to replace. But Jota especially, there are so many different ways you can go. And it also depends quite a lot about how you do your, tra your chips going forward as well. If you're free hitting in Game Week 29 or you're potentially even potentially doing a wild card in game 27 or something like that, then your transfer for Jota this week is going to be pretty different than if you are still just going ahead with no chips until you wild card in game 30 or 31 and then free hit in game 34. If you have that tactic going for you, if you have a lot of players for game 29 already and you need a replacement for game 29, then you have a pretty limited set of options, which I'm going to talk about uh, next actually for Jota. But if you have that other sort of um, solution in your mind potentially potentially doing a wild card in game 27 and uh, and surviving game 29 without a free hit or if you want to do free hit in game 29 then i have a couple other suggestions as well for jota and i'm quite a lot more excited about those guys than than the next three guys that i'm gonna talk about but let's get into the first three guys uh, first and that is the three guys that actually play in game 29 Bowen, Bailey, and Elanga are the three options that I have listed for you guys because they all have fixtures in 29, they all have fixtures in 26, and they are basically the best options, I think, from those three teams. Uh, you could discuss uh, Kudus rather than Bowen for West Ham. You could discuss Douglas Luiz rather than Bailey for Aston Villa. You could also potentially look for Morgan gibbs White or uh, Callum hudson Odoi rather than Elanga, but I think these three are the best uh, players. <laughs> Just quickly on that, I think uh, for Bowen specifically, it's more the fact that we're going to have, or West Ham are going to have Lucas Paqueta back soon, which is going to help Bowen a lot, because if you look looking at his numbers already, you're kind of not looking so good for, for Bowen in terms of FPL stats. But, but what that is also going to affect is how Kudus and Bowen are going to play, because Kudus and Bowen are both at their best at right, at right wing. Uh, and with Antonio coming back, playing as a striker most of the time now, uh, that means that Bowen can't really play up front anymore, and that means that he's most likely going to play at right wing, while Kudus has to play somewhere else. And that's most likely going to be on the left, but sometimes Paqueta plays on the left, because West Ham have a lot of central midfielders already to field in those three spots in midfield. So you have uh, Suchek as an Alvarez, you have Calvin Phillips on loan, even though he's been terrible since he came back. Um, and then you have Lucas Paqueta as well. So you have four players to fit into those three central positions, and Ward Prowse even as well. So five players to fit in those five, th those three central positions. So sometimes, or most times actually, you're going to see Paqueta play wide out on the left, which he has done a couple times this season. So that means that I think Kudus is slightly at a rotation risk. I still think um, Bowen playing up front and Kudus playing on the right is is a chance of happening, but I think Bowen is just a more secure pick. We know, as you can see from his, his minutes here, 540 minutes, he's most likely going to play uh, 90 minutes every single game for West Ham. So, so yeah, I think it's just safer when it comes to minutes, especially with all of West Ham's players coming back fit soon. And also, I did mention Paqueta coming back, and he's been a huge boost for, for Bowen this whole season. They've been linking up really well this whole season, and he's been a major part of why Bowen has struggled so much the last few game weeks. Because as you can see, the last six game weeks that uh, Bowen has played, meaning the last six game weeks, actually, because he's been healthy and, and West Ham haven't blanked a single game week. Uh, in those last six fixtures, he has only gotten 12 points, which means he has blanked every single game. Uh, six times two equals 12. Um, quick maths, I know. But he's basically blanked in six game weeks in a row now, Bowen. It is not good. It's not something that you want for your FPL players, of course. But most of those game weeks have also been without Lucas Paqueta, and he's going to be a huge boost for Bowen. So... 
I don't think Bowen is the worst pick, actually. I think with the two fixtures that he has in giving 26 against Brentford and 28 against Burnley in, uh, yeah, against Burnley at home, I think those two fixtures are really, really good. Giving 27, I feel like you have a lot of options anyway, so I don't think it's too big of a worry. I don't know, at least for my team, giving 27 is pretty stacked, but even Everton away is a pretty decent fixture for Bowen. He scored twice against Everton last season, I think, so... So yeah, I think those three fixtures are really good for Bowen. Aston Villa at home as well is, is not too bad of a fixture either. Aston Villa have conceded a lot of goals lately. They have a lot of defensive injuries and stuff. Bubakar Kamara is the latest one. He's out for the rest of the season, it seems like. So I think the fixtures are really good for Bowen. And I think he has also that FPL track record to show that he's a really good player when West Ham are playing at their best. And currently they are not, but who knows? Paketa might help. And also they might change their manager as well. David Moyes is more and more under pressure as the manager of West Ham. So... So yeah, that could really affect what happens with uh, with Bowen going forward. So, so yeah, I think he's actually my favorite choice if I was not free hitting or or using any chips until game twenty nine. I probably would lean towards Bowen um, if I did that myself, but I'm probably not going to do that myself. I do have Jota, and I do need to replace him with someone. Um, but I'm most likely not going to go for any of these three guys. But let's just go through all of them anyway. Uh, so we talked about Bowen. His numbers are just terrible from the last six game weeks. <laughs> 1.22 expected goal moment, that's pretty bad. One big chance only, that's also really bad. Uh, 11 big shots in the box, uh, it's not too bad, that's that's pretty decent. And five chances created is, is not really that good either. So, so yeah, for a price of 7.8, that's uh, that's just way too much. Uh, <laughs> that, or that, or not enough when it comes to the stats uh, for the last six game weeks, but I think, like I said, things can easily improve going forward, and especially with the fixtures being a bit easier now going forward. So, so yeah, I still like Bowen quite a, quite a lot as a pick, but currently he's not looking the best. So, so yeah, a lot of people will be put off by that. Leon Bailey, on the other hand, is someone that has been pretty electric the last few game weeks. Yes, he hasn't gotten like major returns. Part of that is because he's slightly like a rotation risk still. I think also, I think that's kind of overplayed a little bit, and I think that's why I have him over Douglas Luiz. Uh, the main reason for Douglas Lee's over Bailey, if you want to go with him instead, is the fact that obviously he's on penalties. That's a huge plus. He's also on set pieces, or, or some set pieces at least, for Aston Villa. And he's also more of a minutes uh, safe guy. Like, he's not going to be benched that much. But Bailey, I think, is pretty secure when it comes to Aston Villa minutes uh, currently. The only two games that he's missed in the last, like, 12 game weeks have been, like, from small knocks and stuff. And yes, that happens quite a lot with Bailey. He could get some of those knocks and maybe be out for a game or or something like that, or not ready to play the full 90 minutes, or at least 60 plus. But I do think his minutes are pretty secure. I think it's going to start, I, I would assume he would start all four of these games coming up, but maybe start three of them and be benched for one of them, potentially, uh, which is not the worst thing in the world. But yeah, I think ba Bailey is pretty electric. He has a lot of skills going forward, and he's shown that he can create something out of nothing quite a lot. So. I think he's going to be really good. I think Aston Villa are looking a lot better offensively lately as well. So I think Bailey is also a pretty good pick, actually. And he also has really good fixtures. Nottingham Forest at home in game 26 is a really good fixture. I think that's uh, something you can jump on straight away and get some points for Bailey. Because we know he's going to be fit for, for this game week. They don't have any fixtures before that game week. Um, so I think that's a really good fixture for Bailey. He's most likely going to start in that fixture as well. You can see from his expected numbers, they're quite a bit better, or slightly better, I should say, than Bowen. Still not that impressive, but at the same time, it's with a lot less minutes than Bowen, so it is quite a bit better if you look at it that way. 1.95 expected goal moment, zero big chances, which is kind of concerning, because he's not really in the box that much. Watkins is the one that gets the most chances for Aston Villa, and we'll get to Watkins pretty soon with uh, Darwin Nunez replacements. Uh, but Bailey is, is pretty good in his own right, and just a nice little small pick to have for these four next game weeks before you walk out in game week 30 or 31, potentially, if you're doing this tactic. So, so yeah, I quite like Bailey. I think his minutes risk, uh, like the risk of him losing his starting spot is is overblown a little bit. I think he's going to be the main man for Aston Villa. He's been really good, like apart from FPL as well. He's been really, really good this season, and, and yeah, looked like uh, a really, really good player who, who deserves to play for Aston Villa, I think, this season. So... Wouldn't worry too much about his minutes, but underlying numbers and stuff isn't too good either. So, so yeah, he's kind of like a meh pick, but that's sort of how, what you have to choose when you pick someone who plays in Game 29. So, so yeah, that's just something you have to go with uh, if that's the case. The final pick is more of a risky pick, I guess, in terms of uh, worse fixtures, especially. If you look at the fixtures, Aston Villa away, Liverpool at home, Brighton away, Luton away. Not the best fixtures uh, on paper there for Nottingham Forest, but... To be honest, I can't really find any other third alternative. I looked a bit on Brentford. 
I figured maybe Matthias Jensen would be good. He was good last season, especially at the uh, towards the end of the last season. But looking at his numbers and stuff, and looking at his position from from this year to to last, he was actually way more offensively minded last season and also at the start of the season. But now Brentford are just sort of playing with two strikers and playing with three more central line midfielders. They don't really have that attacking midfielder that Jensen was last season. So he's not really an option either. And I think Elanga as well is probably not someone you want to bring in for Game 26. So he's probably not like the best Jota replacement. He's probably someone you bring in more towards Game 28, Game 29. Maybe for a hit or something like that. But I think Elanga, if you look at his numbers, those are really, really good. He has 31 points, which is more than Bailey and Bowen. Uh, despite playing less minutes than both of them, he's played uh, four games, or he started four games and had one off the bench the last six uh, he's been available for. So, so yeah, but despite that, he actually has better stats than all of them, than both Bailey and Bowen. Five big chances in, in those four matches, which is pretty crazy. He gets a lot of chances, but he misses a lot of chances as well. We saw one against West Ham where he was just completely open and just fluffed it uh, over and wide, even though he had a lot of time to, to shoot and stuff. But... But yeah, he has a lot of expected goal moment, 3.86 from basically four starts and, and one appearance off the bench, which is crazy. Five big chances is really good. Ten shots in the box, which is better than Bailey, slightly less than Bowen, but in less minutes, of course. And then 11 chances created as well. So Elanga is pretty, a pretty versatile pick as well when it comes to that. But it's just the fixtures that are pretty bad for him. Aston Villa away, like I mentioned with Bowen. Aston Villa is not too bad of a fixture, but still you expect Aston Villa to sort of have uh, the advantage against Nottingham Forest in that game and, and make it tough for Nottingham Forest. But at the same time, Ilanga is the type of player who's really good on the counter, so it doesn't really matter if the other team is quite a lot better than them. They can still counter and score goals. We've seen Ilanga score in, in some big games this season as well. So even though the fixtures are pretty bad against teams that are likely to dominate against them, that's not too bad when it comes to Ilanga because he's just a really good uh, counter-attacking pick. That's also also slightly why I prefer him over someone like Gibbs White, who's more of like a talisman guy who needs his team to be the best team on the pitch for him to be at his best potential when it comes to FPL. But Alanga, we know his pace, we know his uh, attacking prowess and stuff. He's actually a decent differential pick if you want to go with someone different who has quite a bit more upside, than, I think, than, than Bowen and Bailey, potentially. Uh, I think all these three guys have a lot of upside uh, at their best, especially that Burnley at home fixture for Bowen. I think that's looking really good if Paqueta, he's most likely going to be back for that game week, especially. Um, so, yeah, I quite like these three picks, but I'm not really entirely sold on either of them. And I'm currently not looking to uh, to go to Game 29 without using a chip either. I'm probably going to free hit in Game 29 or I'm going to wild card before that. Uh, so currently I'm not looking at these three guys myself, but I think all three guys have at least some merit to them when it comes to replacing Jota. But let's move on to the different tactic, and that is using your free hit in Gaming 29 and not worrying about who's going to play or not in Gaming 29, just worrying about 26, 27, 28. Then you can free hit in 29, and then whether you want a wildcard in 31 or if you want a wildcard in 35, for example, those are two different tactics that you could go with if you are free hitting in 29. It doesn't really matter for who you're going to bring in for these three game weeks, Gaming 26, 27, and 28. So let's move on to these three alternatives that I think are actually quite a bit more exciting than, than Bowen, Bailey, and Alanga, even though I quite like all three of them as well. So, yeah, to mention them straight off the bat, Ödegård, Pascal Gross, and Huang Hichan, or Handsome Huang, as he's called on this channel. Three really great picks, and especially looking at their fixtures, just amazing. Obviously, they don't have a Game Week 29 fixture, or like none of them are expected to play in Game 29. That could change. Maybe Chelsea lose to Leeds and Arsenal play in Game 29. Uh, Brighton are most likely. I, I think Brighton is just a write-off. Brighton have to go out against Wolves and Man City have to go out against Luton for Brighton to have a fixture in Game 29. So I think Pascal Gross is definitely blanking in 29. Huang, on the other hand, maybe he's slightly more at risk. I think... I don't know how the how the percentages are for this, but I think Odegaard and Huang are probably like... I don't know, 30% maybe likely, 20, 30% likely of getting a game in game 29. For Huang to be, get a game in 29, Wolves have to lose to Brighton in, in the FA Cup. And then also at the same time, Bournemouth have to lose against Leicester. Uh, Wolves play at home and uh, Bournemouth play at home as well in those two games. So seeing them both lose at home against opposition where, well, I, I, I think um, Wolves could lose. But I think Bournemouth playing at home to, to Leicester, I think they should still win. But who knows? Leicester are the best team in the championship. They are practically a Premier League team. So anything could still happen in those games. And I think that's quite the interesting thing with Wang. But let's talk about Wang last because he's the third guy 
on the list here, let's go to my countryman, my fellow uh, Norwegian, Martin Odegaard, who I think has been just absolutely amazing lately, especially in the last two games. And Arsenal especially have looked really, really, really good. And currently he's my potential favorite. I don't know, I'm, I'm pretty excited about Huang and potentially Gross as well. Uh, but Odegaard is looking really good in terms of how good Arsenal are. You can trust Arsenal to be really good. They're playing against Newcastle at home. Newcastle are really bad defensively. And I'm expecting Arsenal to score three, four goals in that game. And Odegaard is going to be involved in a lot of the, in a lot of the build-up play, at least. Um, so I really like him. Looking at the last six matches, he's played 90 minutes in every single one of them, in, which means 540 minutes total in those six matches. He got 33 points, which is not the best, but most of those points are the last two game weeks because Arsenal have all of a sudden turned a new leaf. Among those six fixtures are the fixtures around New Year's, where they kind of had a, a little bit of a lull and struggled a little bit. But the last two games, Arsenal have been electric and scored 11 goals in those two games. And Odegaard has been in amongst the goals in both of those games. So I think it's a pretty good pick, especially for these two game weeks. But I should also mention, if you don't have Saka at this point, uh, go with him rather than Odegaard, because he's even better than, than Odegaard. But I think most people have Saka already, and if you don't... I think it's actually worth just transferring in, even if you're doing uh, the other tactic of uh, <laughs> of uh, not free hitting and giving 29. Because I think, yeah, he's just too good for the Newcastle at home, Sheffield United away, Brentford at home fixtures, which are really, really good. But that counts the same for Odegaard as well. Three really, really good fixtures for him, and three fixtures where you expect him to start all of them, because he is pretty much a nailed on guy for Arsenal. Uh, but yeah, 33 points, 3.68 expected goal moment, which is really, really good as well. A lot better than the likes of Bowen and Bailey, for example. Um, but zero big chances it is a bit concerning, but he's still also someone that keeps scoring goals from outside the box, which are not considered big chances, but he still has a pretty good chance of scoring them because he's a pretty good um, shooter on from the outside of the box, uh, as we saw in this past game as well against Burnley. Um, so yeah, I quite like uh, Odegaard, even though he, he doesn't have the, the most goal threat, he has a lot of assist threat as well, which is, is pretty good. So five shots in the box, again, not too good, but 23 chances created is amazing. Really hard to match those numbers. Really, like, quite a lot of chances uh, created for Edgar. So I think it looks really, really good. And Arsenal are a team you can trust as well to be the best team in all these three games coming up against uh, Newcastle, Sheffield United, and Brentford. So quite like Edgar. He's a bit pricey, 8.4, so you also have, need to have enough money in the bank. Uh, but seeing as Jota is around the same price, it shouldn't be too too uh, tough of an ask either to get Edgar. Moving on to Pascal Gross, who I also think is a really good option. He, speaking of players that have been really good lately, the last three game weeks, he's gotten the brunt of his 37 points because he blanked the three game weeks before that, I think. But now he's just looking amazing. And the other huge thing about uh, Gross, which is something that Ergor doesn't have, but Huang does have actually, is being on penalties because Joe Pedro is going to be out for potentially all these three games, maybe 26, 27, and 28. Joe Pedro might be out. And with Joe Pedro out, that means Pascal Gross is the penalty taker for Brighton. And Brighton in the Premier League haven't gotten that many penalties, but in the Europa League and stuff, they've gotten penalties basically every single game, it seems like. So I think for that reason as well, Pascal Gross is an even better option because he's going to be on penalties. He's on set pieces as well. And as you can see from the expected goal moment, 4.67 is absolutely amazing. It's better than Ergor. It's better than anyone that I mentioned so far. Really, really good. 37 points, but most of that is the last three game weeks. I think he's gotten 30 points in the last three game weeks or something like that. Um, so yeah, he's just in really good form at the moment. And looking at the other numbers as well, four big chances in total, really, really good, especially for someone we expect to be a creator and like an offensive midfielder. Four big chances speaks to a lot of good things for Gross. He's someone that moves into the box quite a lot as well to be able to shoot and have those big chances. Nine shots in the box, like I mentioned, he does get quite a lot of, get quite a lot of shots in the box as well, Pascal Gross. So it's really good for that matter as well. And then 18 chances created, almost rivaling Odegaard as well on that metric. So Gross, just looking at the numbers, his price, the, the fixtures, it's really hard to go against him, I guess. But I don't know. It's just something about Gross that makes me slightly uneasy. I think there's like that chance of maybe him playing slightly further back in the team with Mitama coming back now. So in March, it's about to come back and Cecil might come back. I think there's just too much when it comes to Brighton and the rotation issues and stuff. Uh, we know Gross is going to play pretty much every game, but where he's going to play and what, what role he's going to be is going to fluctuate a little bit, I think, or at least enough for me to be slightly put off. So by the numbers, um, <laughs> by the fixtures and stuff, and also Brighton just beating uh, Sheffield United final and be looking really, really good, I quite like Gross, but it's just something about Brighton that I don't trust over three game weeks potentially. But I don't know. 
he is a really tempting option, especially looking at uh, the underlying numbers. He's just looking fantastic currently, so he's definitely someone to consider as well. And then finally, my probably favorite option, uh, Huang. Again, really, really good option. He's on penalties. Kunya is out injured. Again, I think for 26, 27, 28. Huang had a pretty good chance last game as well, even though uh, Kunya didn't play, so he's not really affected that much by, by Kunya, I think. I think he's still going to be a really good player. Wolves obviously have the best fixture in all of this, and that's at home to Sheffield United in game 26. They could really score a lot of goals in that game. Newcastle away is also a pretty good fixture, and game 28 against Fulham at home is also a really nice fixture for Huang, who's only 5.5, which is a pretty nice price. 492 minutes in the last six games that he has been able to play. Obviously, some of those games were before the Asian Cup, where he uh, played for South Korea. Uh, but he came back, and, uh, and it's been pretty good apart from that as well. 28 points in total. Again, kind of middling, kind of the same as we've seen from the other, these other guys, around 30 points, apart from Bowen, who got 12 points only. Uh, so that's decent. 2.99 expected goal moment, though, is really good. And a lot of that is actually expected goals. Because you can see, only three chances created. So most of that expected goal in moment is just expected goals, uh, purely. And that's going to be really good for, for getting a lot of points and stuff. Scoring goals is just more valuable than, than getting assists. So, so yeah, that really is, is something that counts really well for... Huang Hechan as well. 4B chances, which is uh, pretty good. 9 shots in the box, pretty good. Same as, as Pascal Gross. And then 3 chances created is, is not the best, but he is a striker. He's going to finish those chances. He's pretty selfish to, to score goals instead, and sometimes you want to see that in FPL as well. And like I mentioned, there is a small chance that he's going to play in game to the 9 as well. And that's maybe something that you want to hope for if you want to go with Huang this this uh, this week. And you already have uh, potentially some Brighton or Bournemouth players in line for Game 28 when they have a double game week. Then you can hope for both Bournemouth and Wolves getting Game Week 29 by both going out in the FA Cup. Because that might happen. Because they face each other in, in Game Week 29 uh, if, if both of them go out of the Cup. Which could happen. We, we don't really know. But we, we could see about that. We obviously get to know this um, at game of 27, so for game of 26, you sort of have to take a punt on Huang, but he is someone that could potentially play in 29, but most likely he's not going to. But I think it's sort of like a nice middle way uh, there if you are still unsure whether you want to free hit in 29 or if you want to go through game of 29 without any chips. Uh, you can go with someone like Huang or potentially someone like Garnacho, who's the final guy that I haven't listed on this who could also play in game of 29. Man United play against uh, Nottingham Forest away in the cup, so if they lose that game, they will have a really tasty Sheffield United at home fixture in game of 29. And Man United also have Fulham at home in game of 26, so I think Garnacho is also another really, really good option to, to consider if you want to do like the, the sort of half measure thing where you go with someone who could potentially play in 29, but still has really good fixtures and still has really good numbers for the next three game weeks as well. So Huang and Garnacho are really, really good. And considering I have Garnacho myself already, Huang is probably the one I'm looking to bring in as well on top of that because Ergor is a bit pricey and I'm not sure how, I'm gonna, how long I'm going to hold him, but he is really tempting. Arsenal are really looking really good. I might just go with Ergor and keep him for the foreseeable future, seeing as my Arsenal play uh, a double game week in game week 34 as well. If I'm going to have free it in, in 29, I want to have Arsenal players for 34 for that double. So, uh, so yeah, he's also of interest for me personally as someone that has Jota and, and is looking to sell him. Uh, but I think Huang is probably currently my favorite. But Gross is also a really good candidate, and maybe I get convinced to do the the conventional route and trying to get a team uh, over the line for Game 29 without using a chip. But most likely I'm bringing in one of these three guys, seeing as I already have Garnacho. Then next up we have replacing Solanke, or Solanke, I should say. Uh, he's one of the replacements potential, potentially for Darwin. We're going to replace Darwin. And one of the plays, the players we can replace Darwin with is actually Solanke. So these are the three main options to replace uh, Darwin Nunez with. And I think all three are really good. Obviously, you have Solanke, who, like I mentioned with Wolves, most likely won't play in Game 29. But the big thing about Bournemouth is the fact that they do have a double in Game 28. So you pretty much need to have Solanke for Game 28 in general. So I think he's just <laughs> like a straight up. If you don't have Solanke already, I think it's pretty straight up to just go from Darwin to Solanke. Yes, he has Man City in 26, but that's that's just something you have to live with. At least it's a fixture. At least he has a decent or potential chance to get points. But after that, Burnley away, double game against Sheffield United and Luton at home. And then after that, in game 29, you could just move on from Solanke to Tony, who's my final suggestion here. But Tony in his own right is a pretty good player or a pretty good pick if you don't have him already. If you already have Solanke, and I'm, I'm imagining most people have Holon and 
probably one of these guys already. Uh, probably Watkins. Probably Holland, Watkins, and uh, and Darwin. If you have Darwin, uh, or maybe you have Holland, Tony, and Darwin. Maybe you have Holland, Solanke, and Darwin. But if you don't, well, regardless of, of uh, how it's looking, I think two of these guys on top of Holland for the next four game weeks is looking pretty good, uh, regardless. But yeah, speak of Solanke first. Six matches played, 538 minutes, which means that there's only eight minutes that he hasn't played in those game weeks. Uh, 30 points is not the best, but at the same time, he's also gotten a lot of points lately, and he's also now having a lot better fixtures, and I think that's going to help Solanke quite a bit, because he is the main man for Bournemouth, and they really need to be the better team for Solanke to be at his best. And that's what's going to happen against Burnley away, Sheffield United at home, and Luton at home. You basically need Solanke for game 28, because he's going to be the most popular captain probably this season, because there aren't really any like major game 28 uh, players you can choose instead of him and he has a double against Sheffield United at home and Luton at home so, so yeah I think you sort of need him for those game weeks so you could put it off maybe you could call Watkins for these two next two game weeks 26 and 27 then you buy to like for 28 and then you buy 20 for 29 that's also an option if you want to go that route but but either way Solanke has uh a double game week in 28, which is really important, and maybe, maybe, maybe he gets that game in 29 fixture as well. But if you want someone who is secure to play in game in 29 instead, and you don't have him already, Ollie Watkins is your is your guy. If you don't have Ollie Watkins, I think you really, really should have him. It's sort of like the same as Saka. He's just proven to be such an important pick, and especially with that Nottingham Forest at home fixture now as well. It seems like a really good jumping on point compared to someone like Solanke, for example. So. If you have uh, Holland, Darwin, and uh, and someone else, not one of those three, one of these three guys, then I think Watkins is probably the pick I would go for like immediately for the immediate future with the, with the next two fixtures. Um, but yeah, 540 minutes. He's played 90 minutes in every single game, 49 points, which is the most out of uh, any of these guys so far. 4.68 expected goal moment, really, really good. Seven big chances, which is quite a lot uh, in general. Uh, so I had six big chances comparatively. 18 shots in the box for Watkins, Slank had 16, and 9 chances created, Slank had 7. So, in general, I think Watkins is just a better pick than Slank, uh, just straight up. But when it comes to the double game in 28, you sort of need Slank. And ideally, I think you should have all three, but there is a final alternative, and that is Ivan Tony. And he's just been amazing since he came back, basically. Uh, so, he's only played five games because he's been. Uh, He's going to play his sixth game now against Man City, so we'll get to see what ha what happens there as well. Maybe he impresses again against Man City as well and looks like an even better pick. So keep that in mind when you replace Darwin as well. Maybe Tony looks absolutely amazing against Man City in a really tough fixture, and you really want him for that game against West Ham because West Ham currently are really, really bad, and that could be a high-scoring game for Tony uh, for sure. Chelsea at home as well, another really good potential game. Game Tony against Arsenal is not the best, but at the same time, uh, that is uh, probably if you have... Um, already have Solanke and, and Holland. That's when you're going to play Solanke, you're going to play Holland, and you're going to play probably uh, a lot of your other players as well, because there are a lot of good players that game week, especially with the, the double game week for both Luton and uh, Bournemouth in Game 28. Uh, so Game 28 is not that big of an issue in Arsenal way. Even if you have to play Tony, that's not the end of the world either, because Tony can score against pretty much anyone, as he's shown. Uh, four goals in the last five games since he returned. Really good. 32 points, which is uh, really, really good, considering it's only been five games. 3.23 expected goal moment. He actually has eight big chances, which is kind of crazy. Because uh, I think in my mind, at least, Tony is like more clinical than Watkins and Solanke. But these numbers do not really reflect that. But yeah, eight big chances. Only 11 shots in the box, though. It's just less than the other guys. But at the same time, that's one game less as well for Tony. You have to keep that in mind. Only two, two chances created. So Tony is more like a, a spearhead to score the final or shoot the final uh, bit of possession for, for Bournemouth. And, and the attack for Born, for Bournemouth, I, I say, Brentford. Uh, so yeah, not the most creative guy, Tony, but he can score a lot of goals, and he's also on penalties, which is something Watkins doesn't have, but is something that Solanke does have, but Bournemouth basically get no penalties at all, so he might as well not be on penalties pretty much. But yeah, I think Tony is a, a really nice differential, like a third guy who you could pick if you want to gain rank and stuff. I think he's pretty good. He is a good uh, alternative to, to Watkins, and also... A uh, really good alternative to Solanke in Game 29, like I mentioned. I think ideally you have Holland, Watkins, and Solanke for Game 26, 27, 28, and then you do Solanke do Tony in Game 29 if you're not free hitting in 29, that is. I'm free hitting in 29, so I'm going to just free hit Tony in. Potentially also another player that I didn't mention for Brentford who might be back at that point is uh, Brandon Buemo. That might also help Tony in that Game 29 fixture against Burnley, especially. I think potentially Game 28 and Buemo could be back. 
Game of Thrones 9 is also potentially a uh, point where Mbwemo could be back. So he's also someone you could consider uh, bringing in for a hit for one of your midfielders in Game of Thrones 8 or in Game of Thrones 9. Because I think in general, the players like Saka, Palmer, Richarlison, these type of guys have really good fixtures in Game of Thrones 7 and Game of Thrones 8. So I think you should really try to keep them for as long as you can. So... So yeah, without any pressing issues, obviously Jota is someone that you should sell pretty soon because he's probably going to go down in price a little bit, depending on if he gets price locked and stuff like that. I'm not quite sure about how that works, but, uh, but yeah, he's probably someone you should look to sell. But if you have someone like Palmer, Richard, uh, Richard is obviously you wouldn't sell because he plays in 29, but uh, Palmer and Saka especially, I think they have just really good fixtures, uh, apart from Palmer this game week, obviously, because he's blanking. Uh, but in game 27 and 28, they have really good fixtures. Uh, and they're just really, really important players to have in general in FPL. So I would keep them for as long as I could uh, if I'm planning to dead end into Game of 29 and then walk in Game of 30 or Game of 31. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it for all the replacement. There's also, also a final guy, kind of like with the midfielders. There's a final Man United option in attack as well in Rasmus Söderlund. We have to mention him as well. He's been on fire lately and scoring goals left, right, and center. So he's another good option that has decent fixtures, especially in game 26 against Fulham at home. I think that's a really good fixture for Söderlund. He also could get that game 29 fixture if Man United lose against Nottingham Forest. Between game 26 and game 27, we're going to know if Man United play in Game Week 29 or not. Because if Hoyland plays in Game Week 29, he plays against Sheffield United at home, and that's a really, really good fixture. So he would be also a really nice alternative for uh, for those fixtures. So, so yeah, just keep that in mind, uh, I guess. Uh, hopefully for me, uh, I don't know, maybe. We'll see. I'm not going to go into my plans and stuff too much in this video, because, yeah, I basically talked about everyone now. Hoyland is also a really good option, like I mentioned. He does have a slight chance of playing Game of 29 as well if Man United go out against Nottingham Forest. They're playing away at City Ground as well, so that's going to be a, quite a tough game for Man United. So maybe they go out. I think in general when it comes to the Cup, just to touch on that a little bit, we sort of have like the the game the, or the teams that we know are blanking or or not that we know are blanking, but we have three fixtures confirmed for Game of 29. And we were expecting one or two more. Probably Luton uh, and their fixture is going to come in in Game of 29. And potentially one more because i think in general with when it comes to the cups and stuff there's always random stuff that happens and we get fixtures that we didn't expect that could happen with man united it could happen with bournemouth and wolves could happen with someone completely different maybe liverpool and everton all of a sudden playing game of nine who knows something like that could always happen there could always be shocks in the fa cup you know whether it's a premier league team against like a championship team or even like a league one team potentially as we saw last year we had Several games which ended completely different to what we expected. I think Spurs lost to some really poor team in the cup, uh, which meant that they didn't blank after all in uh, game week 33 or whatever it was last season. So things like that could happen. So just be, be mindful of being flexible and stuff for the future and uh, be ready to do a lot of different things that you wouldn't expect to do. Uh, and we don't really know what's going to happen. We're going to have a much clearer picture in Game Week 27 what's going to happen going uh, forward in the next few game weeks as well. So for Game Week 26, I think you can just be a little bit loosey-goosey, I guess, uh, if you want to use that term. And just select someone that looks pretty good for Game 26 and worry about the future later because I think there's still so many options. You can walk into Game Week 27, like I mentioned already. You can free hit in Game Week 29. Those things are still options for you. And you can potentially be lucky and get some fixtures in Game 29 that you didn't expect, and you'll be able to get through Game 29 without a free without a free hit. Uh, that could happen to me as well. Maybe we get both Chelsea going out of the cup, and Chelsea Arsenal playing in Game 29, and also we get some Man United going out. Uh, who knows? That could that, that could still happen. So, so yeah, let's see what happens with uh, with those fixtures and uh, and we'll decide from there. But for Game 26. I think you should just have fun. But at the same time, if you want to be safe and go with someone that you know is going to play in Game of 26 and Game of 29, you can choose one of these guys in midfield. And when it comes to the strikers, you can choose either Watkins or Solanke, or either Watkins or Tony as well, even though you want Solanke for Game of 28, like I mentioned previously. But yeah, those are my closing thoughts when it comes to replacements for Darwin and Jota. I did not expect this video to be this long, but 34 minutes in, and here we are, because I just keep rambling. And with that, I'm going to leave you. Thank you for watching. As always, see you next time. Goodbye.